All right, we're letter B in the uh, lesson that we're looking at today, which is dealing with the tabernacle. Last week we talked about uh, the ark that you read about back in chapter 6 uh, and the surrounding chapters of Genesis uh, during the time of Noah and saw the likenesses between the ark and the church. Thus the ark becomes a type of the church. It's a shadow of which the church is the reality. We pointed out the many similarities. Now today we're going to look at the tabernacle, which is another type of the church, and we're going to see uh, remarkable, remarkable similarities between the tabernacle and the church, uh, which helps us to appreciate how every part of God's word really fits together and uh, helps us to gain understanding in both directions, certainly of the shadow, but also the reality of the church. So question number one, under letter B in your outline, the tabernacle, is what is typified by the tabernacle. And uh, what I intend for us to see, and I hope you will see it too, is that the church is typified in a number of different ways by the tabernacle, by its furnishings, and by the arrangement of the furniture, and by the significance of each part of furniture that makes up the uh, tabernacle and its uh, court area complex. Number two, what do Hebrews 8, 5, and Exodus 25, verses 1, 9, and 30 teach us concerning the importance of the pattern of the tabernacle? Uh, I'm sure you've read these, but uh, let me call your attention to it again. Uh, these are things that I think are important, and if we don't read them uh, in some kind of a setting, we may miss some of the importance of what's being said. So I begin with the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 8. By the way, the book of Hebrews, probably more than any other book in the New Testament, really depends upon our knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures to really understand it, because he's just going back and reviewing Old Testament history over and over again to uh, point out how Christ fulfilled all of that, how it relates to us today. But in Hebrews, the last part of verse 5 in chapter 8 says, uh, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. Now this is uh, God speaking to Moses and saying, Moses, uh, I want you to build a tabernacle, and I've given you all the plans while you were alone with me here upon Mount Sinai. But when you get down there and engage in the actual construction, make sure you follow the plan. That's very important. Now, does that have any significance for us today? Well, sure it does. Uh, let's go back to the Old Testament. Uh, in Exodus chapter 25, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, according to all that I am going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all of its furniture, just so you shall construct it and see that you make them after the pattern for them which was shown to you on this mountain. So he's underscoring what we just got through talking about and the uh, pattern uh, for the tabernacle is a type of the pattern that we have for the church. And so just as God said to Moses, make sure you do not deviate from this pattern. Follow the pattern very carefully. Uh, so we ought to not deviate from the pattern for the church, which we have in the New Testament, and follow it very closely. Question number three, in what way does the New Testament point out, uh, point to the Old Testament for our instruction? And I've called your attention here to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Um, in this particular passage, after uh, relating four important events uh, from the Old Testament, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and he said in verse 11, Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the end of the ages have come, referring to this last dispensation. So what uh, is being said here by Paul after telling us about four different stories that are all familiar to us, you can go back and read them for yourself, but he makes a casual reference to all four of these events that took place in the Old Testament. He said, now every one of these events is saying something that's teaching us a lesson that's applicable for us today. 
Uh, you know, uh, from time to time people say, well, I'm not that much interested in the Old Testament. That always bothers me. I think uh, we ought to be interested in all of God's Word. And if we really realized how our correct understanding of the New Testament is dependent upon an accurate understanding of the Old Testament, I think the New Testament would really come alive and say a lot more to us than it does to a lot of people. At any rate, uh, he gave us the 66 books, and uh, they're all important to us. Uh, some people don't like the study of history. Other people love the story of, uh, the study of history. But whether you like it or not, uh, I don't think that we really have the right, I know we act like we do, but I don't think we have the right to say, well, I'm going to pick and choose what parts of the Bible I want to read and study. Now, we do that, but I think ultimately we are hurting ourselves if we deliberately leave any part of the Bible out, even the hard parts, um, like Daniel and uh, Zechariah that we've gone through, and uh, Ezekiel that we haven't gone through. Probably will one of these days, but it uh, takes a while. I, I myself have, uh, you know, I bought a great big thick commentary a number of years ago, sat down and read the whole thing through, uh, just so I could uh, uh, get kind of a better feel for that book. It is a wonderful book, uh, very insightful, but uh, studying it and getting a lot out of it and then teaching it, that's a different story. <laughs> trying to make it clear to somebody else I just feel like I need to get it more intact before I venture in that direction. But uh, anyhow, uh, we do need the Old Testament. And Paul certainly is making reference to uh, the Old Testament to point out it is saying something that helps us to understand the New Testament. And I use this to illustrate the fact that what is said concerning the ark uh, at the tabernacle rather teaches us so many important lessons that are true about the church. So we begin in verse 4, question number 4 by describing the tabernacle. That's why I passed out this uh, piece of paper that has a chart on there. Uh, these are just people's drawings and uh, I copied them out of a book. And so people would draw them differently, but uh, I just want you to see a general idea of what these uh, various things look like. Uh, the tabernacle itself was 45 feet long and 15 feet wide. Now look down at the bottom of your page with all these diagrams. The largest uh, enclosure there contains the tabernacle which is the small enclosure rectangular in shape that's inside and you'll observe that that rectangular shape uh, tabernacle uh, to understand it is 45 feet long and 15 feet wide now if you want to know how uh, wide it is it would be from right here to that wall that's not very wide no and so when you stop to think, the Holy of Holies would be, this is a square. The Holy of Holies was a perfect cube. And so inside this, it's, it's a small room, really, particularly when you get a piece of furniture right there in the middle of it. And uh, it's uh, equal distance on all four sides of this piece of furniture, which happens to be the Ark of the Covenant. Only the Ark of the Covenant, as this uh, diagram would suggest, probably is closer to the back side of that uh, 15 feet of space but um, so the, you have the big court area and then you have the tabernacle uh, within within it now uh, at the rear end and on the two sides uh, the tabernacle was made out of boards and uh, each board was about 15 feet high now, that's higher than this ceiling uh, so when you think about the width and both ways, remember the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, was a perfect cube. And that's significant too. Uh, a symbol of perfection. That's where you're going to find God. He, the only one, is perfect. And so there we have uh, the real part of it. Mr. Glenn? Yes. Um, you said that it was 45 feet long by 15 feet wide. I thought the Holy, play, the holy of Holies was 10 by 10 by 10 by 10. Cubits. Cubits. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. That's inside. Got it. Okay. Uh, 
the uh, top of the tabernacle was covered with four layers. Now when you walk inside the tabernacle, look up to the top, the layer you see is going to be linen, white linen. But uh, on top of the white linen, you're going to see uh, another covering that's made out of goat's hair. And on top of that, there's going to be yet another covering that's made out of, of ram skin. And on top of that, you're going to see another covering, the latter, outer covering, which is made out of uh, uh, fish skin, uh, porpoise or seal. Uh, they use both uh, these fish to describe the animal that was used uh, and skinned and used to make this outer covering of the tabernacle itself. Uh, the courtyard was uh, eight and a half feet high, 175 feet in length, and 87 and a half feet in width. So this gives you kind of an idea, but you see the dimensions, uh, I mean you see the shape of all of it right there. Now the entrance to the courtyard, as was true also with the tabernacle itself, always faced east. Always faced east. That was part of the pattern. Now, uh, this courtyard was enclosed by uh, a curtain of fine, fine linen that was engraved with different colors, purple, blue, and scarlet. Uh, two pieces of furniture were in front of the tabernacle, as you can see here. That round circle represents what looks like a bird bath, I suppose. We're not really given any dimensions of it or any shape of it. We're just told it's a labor. It's a, a place where people wash. And just like there are different shapes of basins that are used in homes today, so there were different shapes in that day also. Uh, the big altar out there in the court area uh, is uh, the altar of burnt offering, uh, sometimes referred to as the bronze or the brass altar to distinguish it from the gold altar that you're going to find on the inside. Now inside, when you go into the uh, table, of, uh, the holy place rather, the first room, which is 15 by 30, uh, to your right is going to be the table of showbread, to your left will be the golden lampstand, and directly in front of you, in front of the veil that separates the holy place and the holy of holies, will be the altar of incense. Uh, and then when you go beyond the veil, which was only entered once each year, on one day each year, and only by the high priest. And he had to be especially prepare himself for that entrance because there was something specific to be done at that time. Uh, that's the only time that this was ever seen by uh, any man. And there was the Ark of the Covenant, which was uh, covered over by the cherubim looking down upon the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. <coughs> And when you look at that Ark of the Covenant, you have a picture of it there. Uh, it's, uh, I don't think it's a very good picture, but it's down the lower right-hand part of your uh, page there. Uh, the lid itself was made of solid gold. And the uh, cherubim were also made of solid gold. And the cherubim, along with the lid, were all made together. So you could not separate one cherubim from the other, nor could you se separate either cherubim from the gold lid, which is called the mercy seat. It's not an accident that it's made out of gold. Uh, and particularly when we make some comparisons, we'll uh, say more about that as we go along, but I just want to plant some of these thoughts in our mind right now as we get an overall view here. Now number five, if you had an aerial view uh, the pieces of furniture in front of and inside the tabernacle, uh, what would that shape tell you? If you were up in an airplane and you look down and you're looking off to the west because off to the west you see the opening into the court area and once you get inside you see it in the furniture and the tabernacle itself and you're focusing just upon the furnishings both in the courtyard and in the tabernacle itself and here you are in an airplane you're taking a picture. When you get that picture developed, you're going to draw a line between the pieces of furniture. What's that line going to be in shape of? A cross. I don't think that's an accident. I think that is really the story that's being conveyed. 
Uh, and particularly when we see how all these relate to the cross. Now that is really central. And here he is hundreds of years beforehand preparing us by a type with a shadow of what one day will become a reality. We'll say more about that in a moment too. Now number six, what is typified by the outer court? The outer court, I think, represents the world, the world all around us. Um, now, that's significant also, but let me give you some scriptures for this. To whom was the outer court open? I've given you uh, some passages in Leviticus and also in Numbers. Let's read each one of these. In Leviticus 4, 3 and 4, I'm going to read it, then you tell me who you could expect to see in this big area. He shall bring the bull to the doorway of the tent of meeting before the Lord, and he shall lay his hand, uh, lay his, he shall lay his hand on the head of the bull and slay the bull before the Lord. Then the anointed priest is to take some of the blood of the bull and bring it to the tent of meeting. Now who do you know was in there? The priest. That's right. Let me read the next passage in Leviticus 4.27. Now, if any one of the common people sins unintentionally in doing any of the things which the Lord has commanded not to be done, and becomes guilty, if his sin which he has committed is made known to him, then he shall bring for his sin offering a goat, a female without defect, for his sin which he has committed. Now, if he brings this into the altar for the sacrifice, is made and the blood is shed. Who is this person that's doing this? The priest. The priest. I didn't read anything about the priest. Oh, well, the, the person being forgiven. Yeah, who's that? How's this described? A common, 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 common man. The common pile. Oh, common, common man, common. yeah. So anybody and everybody. Is the church open to everybody that wants to come in? Yes. Yes, yes it is. And out there in the front is where you take care of making sure your sins are forgiven so you can get inside. Oh. And so once we obey the gospel, then we become a part of the church itself. And it's only after the sacrifice has been made and the washing has taken place that we're actually inside the church. So before a person is ever considered a part of the body of Christ, there has to be a belief in Christ there has to be willing to accept what he's done for us. There has to be a cleansing that takes place at the labor. Yes. But women were not allowed in there, correct? I don't know why they weren't. No. I just, I just I'm glad you bring that up because let me point out something to you. We are not talking about the temple. Right. We're talking about the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a, t a tent. Well, I have the picture. It shows the Good. Fine. Let them see that. The thing I want you to uh, understand here is this, this outer court, just like the outer court of the temple really in Jerusalem, uh, anybody can be there. Any could be out, anybody is out there walking around. It's just open to the public, men and women alike. Now in the, te in the temple, they could even go inside in the first room. Because that was designated as the court of women. They couldn't go any further. But they could not only be in the out, outer court area, and so men and women alike would be there listening to Jesus preach and listening to the apostles later on preach. They're either in Solomon's porch or the royal porch in the area out there in the big court area. Big general area, several acres. Um, now, listen to what I read in Numbers 15, verse 14. You tell me, who might be in here now? If an alien sojourns with you, and one of you may be among you through your generations, and he wishes to make an offering by fire as a soothing aroma to the Lord, just as you did, so shall he also do. Who are we talking about? An alien. Now what's this saying? Jews only? No, no. Even Gentiles. So get the picture. Anybody can be in this outer area. That's important. Now, how does that relate to us today? Well, where did Jesus tell us to go with the gospel? 
the, the whole the world. world to teach the gospel to everybody. So we go where they are. They're out in the world. We want the gospel, the good news of Jesus to be heard by everybody, everywhere. There's nothing that prevents anybody alive from being able to respond to the gospel if they're given an opportunity. And that's our job to make sure they have that opportunity. All right, number eight. Does the outer court illustrate God's outreach to all mankind? Yes. Yes, it does. So is that true today in the church? Yes. 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 What's going on here and now, right where we are, wouldn't it be wonderful if the whole world were engaged in what we're doing? Yeah. It'd be a different world. You can be sure of that. Number nine. What is typified by the altar of burnt offering? Forgiveness of sins. That's the result of it, but what's typified by the sacrifice itself? Repentance. That's what you have to do to avail yourself of it, but what's typified by the ark itself, the altar itself? That's where it's prayers. prayers. We can pray as a result of that, but what's typified by the altar itself? We're giving a sacrifice, <laughs> which is what's done at the altar, but it signifies... Jesus. It's a typification of Jesus. Oh, He's the one whose blood was shed. The altar is where the blood was shed. In Old Testament days, it was an animal's blood. Now it's the blood of Christ. So He is the one that should come to our minds when we think of the sacrifice of Christ. The altar out there in the area was uh, where all animals that were offered sacrificially were killed and the blood was shed. And the blood was smeared on the horns on the four corners of this altar. That's all a part of it. Well, that's a picture of Christ whose blood was shed. So, this is out in the open. Did Jesus die in secret? No. no. Was he a public spectacle? Yes. No. Yes, he was. Were there people there that witnessed what happened that didn't like it? Yes. Yeah, there were. Were there people there that couldn't see any sense in it? Yes. Yeah. Is that true in the world today? Yep. Sure is. Such a likeness, folks. I'm pressing these details because they all just fit when we get when we see the actual reality that created the shadow that comes first in the Bible. <coughs> now that seems strange to us because we always think, well, here's the reality. Now we're going to see the shadow cast. No, we see the shadow first. He knew that we needed to have this preparation to get ready for it, so when it came, we'd be able to describe it. Why? Because, folks, the reality of everyone here right now is not something that any of us can see. And yet I see every one of you and you see me. That's not the reality. Where's the reality? Listen, what, what I see and what you see is someday going back in the ground where it came from. But not the one that's inside. The real you. The real truth is spiritual truth. And God knows that just as we experience it in our childhood, when our little children, they have to draw pictures. They have to make images for us to touch and see, for us to experience with our senses. That's the way we learn. But then we finally get to the point where we realize there's something beyond this that's far more important. Samuel was the one that learned this lesson in a very visible way. Remember how he learned it? Samuel was sent by God to uh, Jesse's house to do what? To pick the next king. That's right. And when he got there, he had all of his sons lined up. And in his own mind, did Samuel have it pretty well figured out which one was going to be the next king? Yeah. What was wrong with his choice? It was the wrong one. It was wrong, yeah. <laughs> and why was it wrong? Because David wasn't there. He was depending upon his eyes. Man, this guy, he looks great. He'd make a great king. And he went down the list. And he thought, wait a minute, I've, I've covered the list. <laughs> I haven't found the anointed one yet. Where is he? And so he said, Where is, do you have anybody else? Oh, yeah. Who's that, David? Where's he? I'll take care of the sheep. We'll bring him in. Brought him in. Him? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't judge this way. You judge by God who gives us insight. 
Do you realize how often we are guilty of making judgment on the basis of what we see, or what we hear, or what we touch? That's not it. We've got to understand the reality. So, but the Old Testament is really important because we are, let's face it, we're a materialistic people, aren't we? Oh, yeah. Boy, do we love the things that we can touch, the things we can see, the things we can hear. We pay a lot of money for a lot of comfort for this whole body. Particularly compared with really caring for the real person. We get our values really mixed up, big time. All of us are guilty of that. I'm not preaching, I'm just confessing. <laughs> All right, number 11. Uh, well, number 10, describe the altar burnt offering. Well, it was made of acacia wood overlaid with bronze or copper. Uh, the acacia tree, in the King James Version, this is called Shittim tree. Uh, it's the same tree. It's a very interesting tree. I don't, to my knowledge, I've never seen one. If I have, I, I wasn't aware of it when I saw it. But it's a tree that grows in Arabia, in Sinai, that area. Uh, it's the hardest wood in that whole area. It's the only tree that you could cut the wood of the tree into planks. And you could be sure that when you cut it into planks, you had a plank of hard wood. Furthermore, it was the kind of wood that no insect could bother it at all. Insect free. Just could not bother. It was not a tall tree. Uh, taller than this ceiling, but not a whole lot. And it was really, generally speaking, didn't come to a point it was more kind of a stubby top. top. But it uh, grew in abundance. But it's the only wood that could have been used at that time. Isn't it interesting how God has all, got this all prearranged? God has arranged for certain trees to grow in certain areas. And, you know, when he created the world, world he said, I don't want to forget to put this tree in this place because I want to use it later on. And he did. Now, be honest with me. How many of you knew what I just told you about acacia trees? You knew that beforehand. Some of you didn't. I think a lot of people did. But to me, knowing some of these details, you know, first time I ever read about acacia tree, I thought, well, I've never heard of that kind of tree before. And didn't really think much about it. Then I decided, you know, I wonder why that tree, I've never heard of it. Well, because I've never seen one, to my knowledge. It doesn't grow around here. At least not that I'm aware of. But it, all of it really fits when we learn all the intricate details about it. Uh, this is a large altar. This is the greatest of the altars. Seven and a half feet square and four and a half feet, uh, four and a half feet tall. Uh, uh, the horns that were on each of the four corners of the altar were not detachable. They were there, and blood was smeared upon them. But they served another purpose, and we'll save that. We'll talk about that in the next question. Uh, number 11. What is the symbolism of the horns on the altar. Now, um, when you think of an animal with horns, do you think of a, a pet? No. I don't either. Uh, do you think of a an animal that's probably pretty tame and harmless? No. no. I don't either. Uh, there's just something about it. it. Sounds to me like a rhinoceros or a billy goat or a bull or whatever. And I want to stay clear, you know. Well, that's what the horns represent. Power. Is there power that's taking place at this altar? Oh, yes. Was there power taking place on the cross of Calvary? Oh, yeah. Yes, there was. And yet a lot of people missed it. They didn't recognize it. Let me tell you something. The power displayed at Calvary is the only power that will get anybody to heaven. The only power. Man cannot create it. He can only accept it. If he's willing, he can be blessed by that power. Now, <clears throat> number
Number 12, why would men clutch the horns of the altar? And I've given you some passages of scripture that you can look up to see uh, why people would go and clutch this. Uh, let me call your attention to Adonijah. Adonijah was uh, uh, trying to take uh, the throne away from Solomon. Now Solomon was God's choice to succeed David when David passed away. And Adonijah tried to get a jump ahead on Solomon. And he created a following and had a following. People rallied to his cause and he proclaimed himself to be the next king. Until it was finally revealed to David, because this was before David had actually died. And uh, Bathsheba and others uh, talked to David about this. So are you aware of what's going on? And made him aware of it. And action was taken then to make sure that uh, Adonijah would not be able to succeed in his venture. But as soon as he realized that he was not going to be able to succeed, you know what he did? He ran as quick as he could to the altar and he grabbed hold of those horns. And as long as he's hanging there with a grip on the horn of the altar, he feels that nobody can touch him. What's he doing there? Looking for mercy. Looking for safety. Is that a pretty place, good place to go to get safety and security? I think so. Again, the type is there. It's, uh, it's really interesting. Uh, this happened on more than one occasion. Um, let me give you one other example. Joab was another person who ended up on the wrong side. He uh, was willing to be a follower of Adonijah. And when that was learned, he ran to that altar too and grabbed a hold of the altar, the horn on the altar, just to try to get the security. Well, obviously, the thing we need to remember about this whole thing is because there's power in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, does that mean that everybody who goes there is going to be saved? Well, not necessarily. It's not just a case of going through a ritual or hanging on to an object. It's a case of uh, who do you trust? And have you really surrendered to that person? So uh, there were people who would go and hang on to this. Adonijah, for an example, did that keep him being killed? No, he was put to death. Uh, this is uh, kind of a departure of what we're talking about, but do you recall reading in the Old Testament about the uh, Cities of refuge? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there was something interesting about the cities of refuge. The city of refuge was kind of a counterpart to the horn on the altar. If anyone had been falsely accused, and he knew he'd been falsely accused, he was innocent. If he could run real fast and get into a city of refuge, nobody could touch it. Well, that was his place of safety. And, uh, he had to remain there for a definite period of time, and the time is indicated in the Old Testament that they had to stay, and after that period of time it was cut up, he then could leave and know that he'd be not bothered. But uh, there were six of these cities, three on each side of the Jordan River, equally spaced on both sides, so there was always some place close enough to anybody throughout the whole area that they could find a place of safety if indeed they were innocent. Well. That's just another sideline as to what the uh, horns on the altar were for. <clears throat> Can you tell me how they transported uh, this altar? With the rods the or rings? Yeah, that's right. There were rings at the four sides, four corners, and there were poles that were put through, and they would carry these by the poles. <clears throat> and on this particular instance, the altar, uh, in its being moved, was also covered and that the covering is made of seal skins. So, uh, and you know, at, at one point in my life, I can't remember when this was, but I thought, uh, where, where did they get all these seals? Mm -mm. Uh, I pictured all this barren wasteland. No, they're not from far from a lot of water. There's a lot of water down there. There's the Red Sea, you know, and other big bodies of water in that area. So there were seals, there were all these things that are available that are mentioned here in the scriptures. And, Sometimes my own misunderstanding of geography gets in my way of realizing that 
Yeah, this didn't really happen, just exactly like he says it does. Number 14, what was the purpose of the altar of burnt offering? Well, this is the way in which people came into fellowship with God. They had to offer a sacrifice. And the law prescribed what sacrifice had to be offered, uh, how you would offer that sacrifice. And there were some sacrifices that were eaten and some that were not. And the most important sacrifice is the sin offering, which was not permitted to be eaten. In fact, it had to be burned up. We'll say more about that in a little, little bit. But uh, this is where all the sacrifices were offered. So the big question comes to us, and we're looking for the type here, do Christians have an altar? The answer is yes, we do. But uh, it's not a railing down in front of a building. Uh, I attended a service one time, uh, and they had an altar call. And this was in a Christian church. And it really sounded very strange to me. I didn't, I didn't know what they were asking. I didn't quite understand. And uh, nobody responded. But the people that wanted the altar call said, well, if no one can come to the altar, I'll come to it myself. And so they went down and knelt down in front of the steps leading up to the platform. I think, that's an altar? I don't quite understand that. That doesn't make much sense to me. Nor does any article of furniture make much sense to me when we want to understand what the altar is. Because this is a shadow. And the reason I bring this up is, folks, there are a lot of people today still living in the shadows. And we're still preoccupied by symbolism. And we become more attached to the symbol than we are to what is being, what's being symbolized. Um, let me read what the scriptures have to say about this. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, according to the law, one must almost say all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. A life is required as a substitute for a life forfeited by sin. So in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 10 through 13, what does he say? We have an altar. I got into a real discussion one time with a preacher. I really liked him. But uh, he preached a sermon. I just could not agree with it. And I just felt compelled to talk to him about it. He thinks that the Lord's table is our altar. I said, that's not what he's talking about. A table is not an altar. Not for us. But uh, he jumped to that conclusion. And he said, well, that is our altar. That's what the Bible says. We have an altar. Well, notice he says in Hebrews chapter 10, 13, verse 10, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Now, this is a big chunk, but don't miss this. Let's pretend now that it's in the fall of the year. Uh, not very far from the period of time we're in right now, literally. Uh, this time of the year was one of the big days in the Jewish community. This is the Day of Atonement. On this day, a sacrifice was offered on this altar, well, two sacrifices, a bullock and a goat. The bullock was offered uh, as a sacrifice for the priest and his family. The goat was offered as a sacrifice for the people. Uh, both animals were sacrificed upon this altar out here in the court area. The priest then, having slain the animal and the blood being shed and sprinkled on the horns of the altar, then takes some of this blood in a container. But before he does that, he goes to the labor and washes himself, bathes himself, 
and having changed his garments from his regular garments into a very special garment for the occasion. With a clean garment, a different garment, with a washed body, and with the blood that had been shed for sacrifice, he then enters into the holy place. And this is the only day in the whole year that he's going to be on, go beyond that veil. By the way, this is a white linen veil in the tabernacle. He'll go beyond that. And when he comes into the presence of the Lord, he will... Uh, I, I forgot to tell you, he brings in some incense and some coals of fire. He, those, those three items. He has the blood, the incense, and the coals of fire. He pours the incense upon the coals, hot coals, and the entire Holy of Holies is filled with that aroma. And then he takes the blood of the bullock and he sprinkles it once upon the mercy seat. Then he steps back and sprinkles it seven times in the area in front of the mercy seat. And all the time that he's doing this, he's confessing the sins of himself and his family to God. And having completed that, then he comes back out into the open area, the court area. And the other sacrifice is offered, the goat. And the entire process is repeated. But the second time, when he is sprinkling the blood once upon the mercy seat and seven times in front of the mercy seat, he's confessing the sins of all the people. When he comes back out, then he takes the blood of the sin offering and places it on the second goat. What's that second goat called? Snake goat. Right. We're familiar with that term. And once again acknowledges his sins and the sins of the people. And then a man designated for this responsibility, very serious responsibility, took this goat far away from everybody else and allowed it to escape. Now what did that man who did that have to do before he could come back into the company of the rest of the people? Washed himself. Had to take a bath. Had to, take, had to fully cleanse himself and wear different garments. Is all this significant? Oh, yes, it is. What's it saying? It's saying, is there a real separation that takes place? Yeah, there is. We're getting rid of sin. And that blood and the animal that was, sh uh, whose blood was shed in the sin offering was not to be eaten burned up, and the blood placed upon the goat, and symbolically, it's gone. All this is pointing to what happens in our understanding of what Jesus has done for us. So who is our altar? Our altar is Christ. He's the one in whom we have the forgiveness of sins. He's the one who has uh, shed his blood all for our benefit. <coughs> So when we talk about the altar, we're not talking about a piece of furniture. We're talking about a person, the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now what is typified by the brazen labor filled with water in which the priest washed before entering the tabernacle proper? Baptism. That's exactly right. Uh, this is one that ought to be abundantly clear to all of us. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22, Hebrew writer says, Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So this, I think, ties what happened when they cleanse themselves at the labor in the Old Testament with what takes place with us in the waters of baptism. It's not the water it's the act of obedience. It's a spiritual thing that is taking place. It's a cleansing that we receive by acknowledging our relationship with the Lord by turning away from sin and surrendering ourselves to His will. Now the laver was a wash basin made of bronze, but we do not know how large it was. We do not know what shape it was. 
But what use was made of the laver? Well, it was used for uh, cleansing, uh, ceremonial cleansing of the priest. Um, when Aaron and his sons were initially cleansed to serve at the tabernacle, their whole body was cleansed. But after that, it would only be the hands and the feet. And this is made clear, particularly when the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into the Septuagint language. What is a Septuagint language? All right, it's a Greek language. So the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament becomes real significant here in helping us to realize what is really the meaning of the Hebrew in light of what we read in the Septuagint. Whereas the Hebrew had one word for wash, the Greeks have two. Luo and nipto. Two different words. Luo means take a bath. Nipto means wash your hands and feet. Oh. Is there a difference? Yeah. One is a total cleansing. The other is a partial cleansing. And so, uh, though they initially had the total cleansing, yet from that day forward, always before they would go in, they'd have to clean themselves. Now stop and think about that. What do you see as relevant in type with us today in view of the practice of baptism when we are totally submerged? Okay, I get that. But what about the partial cleansing? How does that fit? Well, it fits, folks. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is what the first John, the first chapter, tells us all about. So, even though we receive an initial cleansing in our baptism, do we still sometimes sin? Yeah, we do. Is there cleansing? Yes. Well, John said, if we walk in the light and have fellowship with one another, the blood of Christ goes on cleansing us from all of our sins. Yeah. So stop and think about this. No, don't answer this. I'm just going to ask you a question so you'll think about it. But don't, don't answer it. Have you ever heard anybody say, I think I need to be baptized all over again? Let me tell you something. That's impossible. That is not a possibility. Can't be done. It's like Nicodemus' question. Are you suggesting I have to get back in my mother's womb and come out again? Stupid! You can't do that. Neither can you be baptized all over again. I had a girl in Bible college who I knew quite well because I used to be a preacher before she ever went to Bible college, before I ever started teaching Bible college. And she really got turned on at, in her studies at the college. And she began to understand baptism like she had never understood it before. She came to me one day and said, I've got to be baptized again. I said, well, let's talk about it. So I said, do you remember your first baptism? She said, yeah. I said, uh, do you remember what chair you were sitting in when I came to your house to talk to you? She said, no. I said, well, I do. In fact, I can tell you where, dad, where your dad was sitting and where your mother was sitting. And the four of us carried on a conversation because they were concerned about you. You were quite young. And they, as I, were all concerned because she really understand well enough to know what she's doing. I said, I ask you a lot of questions. And if you didn't understand, boy, you did a good job of fooling me. I'll just have to tell you that. But I looked to your mother and I looked to your dad and I asked both of them individually and said, do you think she really understands? Oh yeah, she sure does. She's been talking about this a whole lot. And so I looked at the girl and called her by name and I said, you know, you can't be baptized again. But if you were not baptized at that point, if all you did was got all wet, you can be baptized now. But you're the only one that can make that decision. I can't. I can't read your mind. I did the best I could. 
so did your father and mother. And I think at that age, you had an understanding, a very clear understanding, as best you could at that age. I said, you obviously have a much better understanding now. So do I. But if I get baptized every time I learn something else about baptism, I'm going to be in the water all the time. <laughs> I said, now, I'm not trying to encourage you or discourage you. You're going to stand before God and give an account. But I want you to understand that we're going to keep growing in our knowledge and understanding. The important thing is, did I, with the knowledge I have, realize how important this was? And with the sincerity in my heart, I really wanted to make sure I did what the Lord told me to do. And it was an act of obedience and an act of trust and faith. I said, if you're fully persuaded that it wasn't, then I don't think you've been baptized. I think you just got all wet. But if you were, you don't need to be baptized. You may, you may need to repent. But you're going to have to do that the rest of your life anyhow. You're always going to learn more, I hope. And you're always going to need forgiveness of sins. So I see in this whole symbolism that not only are we receiving the full cleansing in our baptism, we are receiving the partial cleansing that is needed after that as we sin from time to time. But we meet in gatherings like this, and this gives an opportunity for God to keep washing us and make us cleaner and giving us better understanding. Does this make any sense to you? Mm -hmm. But of course, if you were infant baptism, it's, it's, it, it, it couldn't be infant baptism. There's no such thing. Uh, but I mean, yeah, you're exactly right. Those A lot of people believe that. that. <coughs> really baptized. Yeah. And of course, the real clear answer to that question is, what they had to be baptized for? Isn't baptism or remission of sins? Name one sin. Just name one. Just a real tiny one. They don't sin. They can't sin until they reach the age of accountability. You've got to know the difference between right and wrong to have something to repent of. Mm -hmm. And they're not lost. You're just making the parents feel good. Or at least they think they're feeling good. But they're ending up making this child believe that something happened to them that never did happen. And they're giving it a name that the Bible nowhere gives to it. They call it baptism. And anybody who knows the Greek language knows that's not baptism. Don't they have a word for sprinkling? Yeah. Don't they have a word for pouring? Yeah. Don't they have a word for dipping? Yeah. They don't use that word. And yet we do. And why we picked this word? Because it's a catch-all. It sounds so religious. It sounds so nice. But it's so wrong. I just wish that... Uh, Everyone who's trusting in what happened to them as a baby that was done for them by somebody else would come to an awareness that uh, that doesn't fit the pattern. Well, uh, number 19, what happened if the labor was ignored? Uh, I want to read to you what happens. So we're just going to bypass it all together. Now, who's this affecting? Are there not people today that believe you're saved and then you're baptized later on? Well, that's, that's a stretch. Let's, let's look at what Exodus chapter 30, verses 20 and 21 say. When they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water. This is the next four words, five words. That they may not die. try to bypass the labor? Not going to happen. What's the penalty? Death. Wow. They may not die. Or when they approach the altar to minister by offering up in smoke a fire sacrifice to the Lord, so they shall wash their hands and their feet that they may not die. And it shall be a perpetual statue for them, for Aaron and his descendants throughout their whole generation. Now, folks, the thing that makes this so important is the fact that it's a life and death matter. We've got to take this seriously. Uh, number 20, what followed the cleansing at the labor? 
Well, the preacher, uh, the priest rather, then was anointed with oil. That followed his immersion. And at this anointing, blood was placed upon his ear so he could hear the voice of God, on his thumb so he'd do the will of God, and on his big toe so he'd walk in the path of God. All this is symbolism. But this anointing took place with the priesthood. What is that anointing today? Do we have an anointing? When we get into the study of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to spend a whole lesson on this. Folks, our anointing is the Word of God. Very clearly, that's our anointing. And who does this anointing? The Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who moves into our life at the moment of our baptism, at the very beginning of our Christian life, using that Word which sets us aside is an anointed person somebody that's not set aside? We are separate. Does not the Bible teach? Come out from among them, be you separate? Mm -hmm. Yes, we are separated. And what is it that helps us to understand the separation? God's Word. That's what says you no longer do this. Now you begin to do this. There's a difference. This is the anointing. As we grow in our understanding and knowledge of God's Word. In Exodus uh, chapter 29, verse 7, Then you shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. In Exodus chapter 29, verse 20, You shall slaughter the ram and take some of his blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear, on the lobes of his son's right ears, on the thumbs of their right hands, on the big toes of their right feet, and sprinkle the rest of the blood around on the altar. That's what I've just been telling you, but it's there in the scripture, Exodus 29, 20. So following our immersion when the blood of Christ washes away our sins, we do not need to be immersed again and again, but we do need to be forgiven again and again. And that comes through prayer. That becomes through walking in the light. 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light, what is the light? Thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. That's the, that's the light. Walk in the light, we receive the cleansing power the blood of Christ. Now, the holy place is a type of the church on earth. So next week when we continue our study, we're going to look very carefully at each of the furnishings inside the church. And all of them will play a very, very important role. Let's pray.